Okay. So authentication, in particular, we're going to look at two different ways that we can do authentication. We could either use sessions and we can use tokens. And they both have their own pros and cons. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so a quick overview for this particular lecture. I'll do a quick introduction on what authentication is in a web application. Then I'll define what sessions are. We'll define what tokens are. We'll compare sessions versus tokens. We'll look at the options for authorization in our single page applications and in our APIs that we're designing. Uh, then we'll go ahead and look at Node, in particular, what Node modules are there for sessions, what Node modules are there for these uh, JWTs, uh, and what Node modules are there to provide authentication as kind of a service in itself or, uh, or uh, kind of a full solution to authentication. Okay. So why do we need session or tokens for authentication? This is a this is probably a good question, right? The motivation for these things. And it's of course the fact that HTTP is stateless. All the client requests are stateless. However, there are clearly situations where we would like our states to be remembered. So for example, in an online shop, if we were to put bananas in a shopping cart, we don't want our bananas to disappear when you go to another page, say, to buy apples. We want our purchase state to be remembered while we navigate through the online shop. And so either sessions or tokens give us a mechanism to allow us to use the stateless HTTP uh, protocol, but to also maintain a session uh, throughout the duration of the user's visit. So I want to I want to uh, differentiate a couple of concepts. Uh, I want to talk about authentication versus authorization. Authentication is when you verify an identity, you authenticate something, you say, yes, that's a thing. Authorization is slightly different. That's more or less the concept of verifying that, that thing has the appropriate permissions. So you might be, so, so I guess to, to, to put this, in a um, uh, perspective, imagine if you wanted to go into a bar before you turn 21. They could check your ID and you could be authenticated as that person, but you might not be authorized to go into the bar if you don't meet the age requirements. And so that's just a, a, a sample of how those distinguish. And so they have different HTTP responses for whether you are authenticated or fail to get authenticated versus fail to get authorized. So 401, unfortunately, okay, so 401 unauthorized really means not authenticated, but it's, it's the word we're stuck with on that. And 403 forbidden means that we're not authorized. We don't have access. We're not to uh, for that that particular uh, data or whatever is being requested. And there's two different schemes that we can use for username and passwords. We can use either stateful, which would be implemented via a session using a cookie, or we can use a stateless approach, and th that's where we would use tokens. And tokens can be implemented using uh, JWT, it could be using OAuth, or some other kind of framework to be able to implement these tokens that end up getting stored on the client side, whereas stateful means that this gets stored on the server side. So let's take and first examine sessions. We'll look first at the flow of how authentication works in a sessions-based model. So first, the user would submit some login credentials, such as an email and password. The server would verify the credentials against some database or data store. The server creates a temporary user session. The server issues a cookie with that session ID, and that's the only information that it, it then has, that session ID, which corresponds to the session that the server is going to maintain. The user sends the cookie with every request that they make thereafter. The server validates it against the session store, so the database of sessions, and grants access if that is a a valid session, and when the user logs out, the server destroys the session and clears that cookie, or tells tells the browser to clear the cookie in its response. 
So again, to look at this view in a more profitable approach, and as opposed to a bullet point, the server creates a session. So here we have the browser. It's going to go ahead and send a post request to user slash login, for instance. And inside that body of the login, it might include a username and password. So the server's gonna receive this, create a session. It's gonna store that session in the server memory. It's gonna send back to the browser some cookie, that cookie is going to maintain the session ID. So that is that information is embedded in the response header. And that's going to then be given to the browser. And every time the browser now spend, sends a request back to the server, it's gonna include that cookie. And it's gonna allow the browser and the server to now maintain a session between each other. So now when we sent a, say for instance, an authenticate request, it will include that session ID with a cookie. And when the server gets that request, it, it's going to see that a cookie exists and that cookie has an ID. So it's going to check that cookie to get the user info and then send back the response. If it's a valid session, then it'll go ahead and send back the expected response. If not, it'll do some kind of redirect to log in or it doesn't have access or something like that. Okay, so let's talk about features, um, uh, session features. So every user session is stored server side and that's what we mean by it being stateful. It can be stored in a number of different places. By default, it's typically just stored in memory. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but uh, we can also store it in files. We can store it in some kind of cache like Redis or Memcache. We can store it in a database like Postgres or MongoDB, but it has to be stored somewhere. Uh, so it's the server's responsibility for storing it. Each user is identified by a session ID and so it's what's called an opaque reference. So you can think of opaque as being the uh, opposite of transparent. So what we mean by th this is that no third party can extract data out. The session ID is just an ID, it's just a sequence of numbers. It's used for validation on the server side to get the corresponding session object. So it means anyone can read it and it's not really meaningful. Only the issue where the server can map that uh, ID back to any meaningful data. Uh, it's stored in a cookie. So it's signed with a secret, a secret that only the server knows so that the server, uh, and it's also protected with flags. So session features, uh, they're typically commonly used with server-side rendering web apps. They're commonly used in frameworks such as Spring or Rails or Express or in scripting, in scripting languages such as Node. Okay, so sessions, the, what allows sessions to, to be a thing is the concept of a cookie that then exists on the browser. So the session information is maintained by the server and then a cookie attribute in the header is then passed to the browser and to the client, just like you could have an authorization attribute or content type inside the header, right? It's just a header type. Uh, it's used in session management, personalization, and tracking, right? So there's a number of reasons why you might have cookies that are sent to your system. Uh, they typically, a cookie consists of a name and a value, so it's a name-value pair, and it's, set, uh, and it's set with a set cookie command, essentially, by the server, append it with the cookie by the browser. So Imagine that this is our response object that we get, our, our HTTP response that we're getting back from our web server. So we're gonna get the type of HTTP that you, you might recall, the status code indicating it was uh, okay. Uh, the content type of the response, text slash HTML. And then inside the header, we will have an instruction to the browser to set a cookie. And remember a cookie is set with a key value pair, a name value pair, where in this instance, the name is sesh ID and the value of the session of this uh, cookie of our key here is this. Of course, to delimit it between the key and value using uh, equal sign. And then each, and then a cookie can have uh, a couple of additional flags or attributes in addition to the actual uh, key itself. It can have a domain for where this key is applicable to Right, so we can have a session that's only available on a certain path and on a certain domain. And so in this instance, this particular session cookie is only good at domainexample.com 
at the root path or Okay, so let's talk about the security of cookies. They're signed with essentially hashed max with a secret to mitigate any tampering. They're rarely encrypted uh, to protect against reading. And the reason why is there's no real security concern if some third party reads it. It does not carry any meaningful data. It's just a random string. And even if it is encrypted, there's still just a one-to-one -one match on that. Uh, they are encoded. They're usually encoded in uh, base 64, but it's not for security purpose, it's for compactness. I, it's to compress it, the information, it's to compress uh, uh, the data to transmit from the client to the server and back. So some attributes that our cookies can have, we saw some, we saw the domain and path, that can only be used on a given site and route. Uh, cookies can also have an expiration. So they can only be used until that expiration date is hit. And if that's omitted, then it just becomes a session cookie. So it gets deleted whenever the browser is closed. Uh, if this was set though, you could close the browser and reopen it. And let's say you had a session expiration of two hours, then it will last two hours regardless. It maintains that session. So uh, flags that are worth knowing from these cookies that manage your sessions, HTTP only. So what this does is you cannot, uh, it cannot be read with JavaScript on the client side. So that cookie is only designed for transmitting to the web server for identification purposes. It's not designed to extract, to, 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 to be read uh, from the client side. You can also go ahead and have them be secure. So you can only be sent over some encrypted HTTPS channel. You can also declare that a cookie uh, have the same site flag. And what this means is it can only be sent from the same domain, i.e. there's no core sharing that's allowed with that cookie. OK, and so that brings up one potential uh, security risk that cookies introduce is CSRF. That stands for cross-site request forgery. It's a sim, and so it's always important to cover the security risk whenever we start talking about building distributed applications where uh, machines have to transmit or transfer data across uh, a network lines. So in this instance, one of your vulnerabilities you might expose yourself to with cookies is a cross-site request forgery. It's a, it's a type of attack that forces an end user to execute unwanted actions on a web application in which they're currently authenticated. So really the idea here is uh, some other application is going to try to use your cookie to request some service. OK. Let's move on to tokens, the alternate model of being able to have a server identify a client between requests. The, the typical flow for a token-based approach is you would have a user who submits login credentials, such as an email or password. The server would then verify the credentials against the database. The server generates a temporary token and embeds the user data into it. The server responds back with the token in the body or the header. The user stores the token in client storage. The user sends the token along with each request. The server verifies the token and grants whatever access is required. And then when the user logs out, the token is cleared from the client storage. So this is the typical flow. So pretty similar, but the big difference here is that the data that was maintained on the server end using sessions and cookies is actually going to be stored in the token and transmitted and uh, to the client where the client will now be responsible for tracking that information and sending it back to the uh, to the server. And so this is this is why we call this stateless from the server's perspective because the management of the data is now uh, put on to the client. So again, let's look at this flow one more time, but in a more graphical approach. So suppose we have this inner communication between the browser and the server, where the browser 
would go ahead and send some post requests to say user slash login. Inside of that body of the request would be a username and password. The server would receive that request. It would create a, um, a JavaScript web token, a JWT. I haven't formally described that, but we'll get to that slide uh, with some secret. And then it will go ahead and send that JWT back to the browser where the browser will now store that. Now, let's say that the browser wants to send some kind of authentication request to the server. It will go ahead and include that JWT in its header. So inside this header is this data here. When the server receives that request, it will, it will check that JWT signature and then get the user information from it and send whatever response is needed from that. So some features for tokens, tokens are not stored server side. They're only on the client. And so this allows them to be stateless. They're signed with some secret to protect against tampering. So essentially, if you go ahead and sign or, or hash against it, you could see if it, it's changed in an unexpected way. This allows the server to verify to ensure that it can trust that token. Tokens can be opaque or self-contained. So it carries all required user data in its payload, uh, reduces the database lookups, but exposes data to cross-site scripting attacks. Um, typically sent in some kind of authorization header. Uh, when a token is about to expire, it can be refreshed. So there are these ideas that there are access tokens that grant access and refresh tokens that update the expiration date on your access tokens. And they, they are typically used in single page uh, web applications and web APIs and mobile apps. So it is uh, reasonable to either use tokens or to use uh, session cookies. They're, they're common. I mean, both of these types are common across web applications. Uh, going back to JWT, again, that stands for uh, uh, JSON Web Tokens. It's an open standard for authorization and info exchange. They are compact, they're self-contained, and they are URL safe tokens. They can be signed with either a symmetric key or an asymmetric key, which has a, some public and private component. An example of what a response containing a token would look like would be here, uh, right here in this gray box. So let's parse this. Uh, HTTP version 1.1, this is 200, so it was a success. The content type of this is an application slash JSON uh, for, for this purpose. Uh, the authorization, like we said, we send tokens using an authorization header. We send cookies with a cookie header. So the, the header type is going to be different between a token or a session-based approach. Uh, and then this is actually, this is all on one line, actually. This isn't a new line. It's just it's so big that uh, my text editor here uh, broke this up. But uh, the it's going to be a two-key word. Um, uh, value for authorization. It's going to be bearer, and then it's going to be the value of the token. Now, the token here is uh, encoded in base UR, uh, uh, it's encoded in base64 URL. So you'll see that there's actually periods. These periods are delimiters. I have a period there and I have a period here. And so that those periods contain the header of the token. And again, this is actually, this could be, this could be decoded. This isn't, this isn't uh, encrypted, it's just encoded to go ahead and reduce the space on that. Um, and then here, this would be the payload or the claims of the token. And then we would have the signature. So to, if I go ahead and decode that for you, let's break this apart between these periods. So let's break the header from the payload from the signature. The header, if I were to decode that, would have the algorithm type that this token uses and the actual type. So the algorithm is HS256 and the type of token is, is JWT. 
So that's meta information for this token. The payload, if I were to go ahead and decode that, might be whatever information is being saved on the client side. So for instance, it might be the subject, like the user ID. Um, it could be the uh, uh, maybe the name, such as, uh, which we'll refer to as the claim. So in this instance, name might be John Smith. And then we have an IAT, so issued at in seconds. And so this would be the second since they issued that. And that signature is just some hash value. It doesn't actually get decoded into anything. It's what the uh, server is using to check to make sure that this is a valid uh, token. And actually, just to prove that this is uh, just to prove that this is not encrypted but just encoded, we can actually decode this in the browser itself. Let's go to. Uh, uh, Uplink. Okay, let's go to our developer tools. And then I, I can actually go ahead and grab this. You'll see that uh, this A to B actually will decode a B64 uh, URL. So you can see that I can actually just decode that just like that. And I could decode this, presumably, very same way, right here in the browser. With the subject, with the name, and with the um, IAT issued at time. Excellent. OK, so let's talk about the security with uh, these tokens. They are also signed with some kind of hash map with a secret, uh, guarantees that the token was not tampered, and any manipulation, such as to the expiration time, will invalidate the token. Uh, they're rarely encrypted. Web clients need to be able to read the token's payload, typically. This is why you usually use tokens. So, uh, and, um, and you can't store the secret in the client stored secret securely anyway because it's publicly exposed. Uh, and then it's encoded in a base 64 URL, not for security, but for transport. So the payload can be decoded in red. We saw how we could just do that in the browser moments ago. Uh, so no sensitive or private information should be stored in one of these tokens. These uh, access tokens should also be short lived. And then you can always send refresh tokens to update the uh, duration of the access tokens. So we talked about the security risk for uh, sessions or, or cookies. Let's talk about the security threats for uh, these tokens. They are vulnerable to what are called cross-site scripting attacks. Essentially, this is where you can have some client-side script injection or a malicious code that can access your client storage to either steal your user data from the token, because remember, your data is being stored on the client side, or it can initiate some AJAX. AJAX is just stored for essentially a synchronous JavaScript request on your behalf, since it has your information and uh, available to it. And so an AJAX request might be a request to some external uh, like a fetch request to some other domain. You can mitigate these cross-site scripting attacks by sanitizing and escaping user input. So cross-site scripting are commonly done through, say, for instance, a form element where if you're not sanitizing the input on a form, it's possible that someone might embed JavaScript instructions that then get executed in the client or, or server uh, side of the application. And so that's, that, that's one example of how cross-site scripting might occur. If you're interested in these attacks, by all means, uh, I, I leave it to you to do more research on it. I just want to highlight uh, vulnerabilities that might exist with these uh, implementations. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the tokens in terms of how we're going to store them. So clearly we have to use client storage. Before we talked about on the uh, sessions and uh, with sessions, we could store those in either the server's memory or inside of a database or inside some, some, some sort of cache. 
But on our browser side, on our web client, we have to use client storage. So that means we could either do it in local storage or session storage. And these are actually two very similar things. Uh, again, if I go into my browser really quick, we've seen examples. We've seen examples of local storage before. Uh, I don't know if I've given an example of uh, session storage, but it's exactly the same thing. If I type in session storage, you'll see it's a predefined object. Oh, I don't have access to it in about colon blank. But you can see it's part of the window object, just like local storage is uh, part of the window object. Although I can't have access to it inside of about colon blank. I actually have to be on an actual web domain to have these be able to store data. But they're they're very similar. The only difference between local storage and session storage is that local storage has no expiration time, where session storage will automatically get cleared when the page is closed. So a little bit more about local storage and session storage. It's a browser key value store with a simple JS API. Again, we played around with this. Uh, one of the requirements of the first homework was, uh, first JavaScript homework was to use local storage so you got familiar with it. So some pros and cons of local storage. Uh, well, pros, it's domain specific. So each site has its own uh, and other sites can't read and write to it. And so uh, its max size is much higher than a cookie. The max size of local storage is five megabytes, whereas a cookie can only hold four kilobytes. Because remember that cookie is being sent with every request, whereas the local storage, can go ahead and preserve that. Uh, although, if you're sending a token, you probably don't want to send five meg tokens. I don't know. Uh, some cons about uh, about local storage: it's plain text, hence it's not as secure by design. Uh, it's limited to string data, hence why we have to serialize our JavaScript data when we go to insert into local storage. You might recall that we use the JSON parse and the JSON stringify methods to first pass either uh, any kind of reference data type, like array data or JavaScript objects, so that we can serialize it so it takes the form of plain text. And then when we recall it, we have to, we have to parse that data back into a JavaScript object or an array. It can't be used by web workers. We haven't talked a lot about web workers, but web workers allows us to do uh, concurrency inside the browser. So we can't, we, we would not be able to use that functionality using tokens or using local storage. They are stored permanently unless they're removed explicitly. And uh, it's accessible to any JS code that's running on the page, including some code that might have been injected based off of a cross-site scripting attack. So in this instance, scripts can steal tokens or impersonate users. OK. So these uh, the clients. So this is best for, again, client storage is best for public non-sensitive string data. It's worse for private sensitive data or things that are not easily turned into strings. Okay, so let's talk about these two. Let, let, let's talk about the pros and cons uh, versus these two different methodologies. So we talked about sessions. We talked about JWTs, these tokens. Uh, these. So sessions with cookies, the pros here are that session IDs are opaque and carry no meaningful data. So opaque just means that it's just the ID itself. It doesn't include anything alongside with it. Uh, cookies can be secured with flags. So we can apply like the same origin flag or the HTTP only flag or HTTPS, right? So we can go ahead and secure how these cookies are treated and handled. Uh, HTTP only cookies can't be compromised with cross-site scripting exploits because they cannot be read client side. And uh, this approach is pretty battle tested. This was, this is the original approach that's been going on for 20 plus years uh, across multiple languages and frameworks. So some cons to this sessions cookies model, 
Well, the server must store each user session in memory. So this is a little bit more taxing server side. Uh, session off must be secured against the uh, cross-site uh, forgery attacks that might occur. And horizontal scout scaling is much more challenging uh, where you have a risk of a single point of failure or you need sticky sessions with load balancing. So uh, essentially what this means is scaling your servers up can be a little bit more challenging because then you have to determine how are you going to share all of your session uh, data uh, server side. So that becomes a responsibility. If you decide to operate, let's say two or four or 10 servers to request multiple clients. So now let's look at tokens and authentication and the pros and cons for it. The pros would be the server does not keep track of the user sessions. So it's very simple server side. Horizontal scaling is much easier. Any server can verify the token. Cores is not an issue if authorization header is used instead of a cookie. The front end and back end architecture is completely decoupled, so it can be used with mobile apps. Uh, and it's operational even if cookies are disabled on the browser end. So these are a lot of pros and might justify why you might want to go with a token based model over a session based model. The cons, though, are that the server still has to maintain a blacklist of revoke tokens. So why, why might you want to revoke a token? Uh, well, it's possible that you, uh, if a token was tampered with, for instance, uh, you'd want to go ahead and reject it or clear it. Regardless, there are tokens that you want to uh, remove, and therefore on your server side, you will then have to maintain a list of tokens that you're no longer honoring. So that kind of can defeat the point of statelessness. A uh, better approach, though, if your, instead of blacklisting would be to maintain a whitelist of all active user sessions. And then you check to see if a token that's given to you is part of this uh, active list, uh, part of the, the uh, current list, and then you can nix that off. This, this is the better, but both of these are stateful approaches, whether you're, you're uh, tracking the tokens that you want to revoke or you're tracking the tokens that are allowed, which is, Again, pretty common with token management, you still have to have some stake. Uh, when scaling, the secret must be shared between all servers. And so that can cause a security issue of how you're going to share that secret in, uh, data. Uh, data stored in a token is cached and can go stale or out of sync. If you recall, one of the requirements I said HTTP servers were was a source of truth. Now, if the data for each session is being tracked by the server, you don't have to worry about the source of truth being out of sync, what the client knows and the server knows out of sync. But if you have data stored on the client side, it's possible that the cache data on the client side becomes stale or out of sync with the server data. And that's, that's never good. Uh, tokens stored in the client storage are vulnerable to these cross-site scripting attacks. We've mentioned that. And uh, tokens do require for JavaScript to be enabled to be able to implement local storage. Okay, so what are our options for authorization in our single page applications or in APIs? Uh, let's look at sessions. Let's look at our stateless JWTs and let's look at our stateful JWTs. So for sessions, uh, sessions are persistent on server side and linked by a session ID. So the data itself is on the server and then the ID to get to that data is given to the client or to the browser. The session ID is signed and stored in a cookie. It's sent via a set, set cookie header. And then you can have these flags. HTTP only, secure, and same site. Uh, and scope to the origin with either domain and path attributes. OK, again, things that we already covered. State, now there's two forms of JWT. We can either do the stateless approach or the stateful approach. The stateless approach, the user payload is embedded into the token. The token is signed and a base64 URL encoded. We saw how we can decode that right in the browser. We do that to make it more compact so that it's uh, it's smaller to transmit 
from the server to the client. It's sent using the authorization header, as you might recall, in the example I showed. And then it's actually stored on the client in either local source or session source. The server retrieves the user information from the token. So it, it actually pries the token open to get the information. No user sessions are stored server side. It's only, only revoked tokens are persisted and refresh tokens are sent to renew the uh, access token. And then if we want to talk about how we might manage a stateful JWT, well, only a user reference such as an ID is embedded into the token. The token is then signed and base64 URL encoded. Again, we do that sent as an HTTP only cookie. So here we can actually send a code token. So we can use tokens like cookies. We can use the header of a cookie. We use just the ID of the token. And then we also sent it along with this non HTTP uh, X uh, CSRF token cookie. And so the server will use the reference or the ID in the token to retrieve the user from some database. So in this instance, no user sessions are stored on the server uh, either. And the revoke tokens still have to be uh, persisted. So in my opinion, I typically prefer going with sessions. They're usually better suited for most web applications and websites. And my justification for why these and not JWTs is that the server state, typically you want your server to maintain some state anyway. It has to be maintained. Uh, sessions are easily extended or invalidated. The data is secured on the server site, and you never have to worry about leaking it through a, a cross-site scripting attack. It's easier to mitigate against these cross-site forgeries than cross-site scriptings. Uh, the data never goes stale since we maintain it in the database. The sessions are generally easier to set up and manage than tokens. So most apps and sites uh, don't require the scaling considerations that tokens provide as a strength that can cause issues with sessions. And so for that reason, I would recommend uh, using sessions and, and the lab will use the session-based approach. So auxiliary measures you might just want to be concerned about in addition to authorization would be like IP verification or user agent verification or two-factor authentication or API throttling to prevent too many requests. But that is outside the scope of this lecture and this class. These are just other things you might want to consider. So let's talk very briefly about how we can go ahead and actually implement either sessions or tokens in node and node modules. So the features we would want to implement are like login or logout or register along with session expirations, email verifications or password resets or password confirmations or persistent logins or account lock lockouts or even rate limiting. So these are all things we'd want to be able to do inside of our server using some kind of session module. So again, we're using it for authentication. We're using it for session management. We would use it for timing out a session. So these are the, the, these are the features we'd want to be able to get from a module to do this for us. So one module we could use for this purpose would be the express-session module. We could read about it on NPM. I forgot to mention that NPM uh, for at any time Acts much as a uh, as an API for all third-party modules, since that is the installer. So if I want to learn more information about Express Session, it tells me what the options are here. It shows me what all the attributes are, and it even gives me sample code on how to use it. That is true for everything that's posted through NPM that I can install for. It. Anyway, so I, I advocate that you read the NPM uh, API, but to give you the highlights, to give you the, the best hits, it's a session middleware for Express. It applies middleware functions or features before the route handlers. Note that session data is not saved in the cookie itself. It's just the session ID, so session data is stored server side. A session object is placed as a property inside of our request object, which is then passed to all the other middleware functions and a request handler uh, function. And so when uh, with a uh, session object, a session object can have a cookie object. 
which tracks a domain or a path. It has an expiration date. It has those flags we were talking about. So all this information is inside this cookie object that's maintained by this module. Uh, a session can also have a name. A session can also be told whether it should resave or force save uh, into the session store every time a new request comes. Usually this defaults to true, but normally we would reset this to false. We don't want to do that. The one required property that a session needs to have is a secret. Some secret used to sign your session ID cookie. Should be a really long and complex string. Um, and then also a store, the default store is the memory store, which is good for testing, but you're gonna wanna actually store your sessions either in a database or in some kind of a cache or something. Anyway, so these are all the properties that a session might have. Okay, let's see here. Let's talk about modules we might use for the session store. Uh, we can connect to Mongo, so we will learn about Mongo soon. Uh, so our database layer or data persistence, and we can actually go ahead and use a module called connect Mongo that connects our session object into a Mongo database. Or if we want to use Redis, which is a, a cache, we can also use connect Redis to some uh, Redis instance. So all sessions are stored in memory. By default, they are stored as objects in the server's memory. However, the other implementations to store the session data in either Redis or Firebase or MongoDB or Postgres, if you want to persist them to an actual storage, you can connect them to Redis as just a, an example. Uh oh, that's not what I wanted. And then you can actually see, actually, let me go back over here. If you want to see all the different capable session stores that you can connect to save your session data on your server side, it would be here, compatible session stores. And these are all the modules. And you can click on any one of these and look at how to use those. OK. Uh, an example. Another common thing we might want to do once we start talking about authorization and authentication is we want to secure some routes. Say, for instance, you have a home route that you're supposed to bring a logged in user to. Clearly, you only want the user to be able to access that route if they're currently logged in. You don't want a non logged in user to access a home, like here's your home page route. And so one way that we can secure or protect that route is by defining local middleware functions ourselves. So we could, essentially what we would do is we would create a function that checks to see if a session, uh, if there's a session object in the request object that we've received and it contains the required uh, credentials. And if it doesn't have those required credentials, then we would redirect it to like a login route. And if it does, then we would send it to the route handler to the request handler to fulfill that request. So an example of this is suppose that I created this function, redirect login, that takes in a request, a response, and a next function, because this is middleware, so it requires that there are parameter. And all it's doing here is it's going to look at the request object to see if it has a session object, and if that session object has, say, for instance, a user ID. So this is something we would have embedded into that session object. If it does not have that, then we would send the response, we would tell the response to redirect the uh, client to the login page. Otherwise, it would go ahead and move on to the next middleware function or move on to the quest handler to actually fulfill this request. And so the goal here is to prevent some unauthorized requests from accessing what are gonna be called protected routes. So you will actually get to see this in the lab, but there is a notion that we will want to do this to protect routes that are not supposed to be public routes. They're designed for only logged in users. Uh, other modules we might be concerned about using is uh, bcrypt to be able to hash passwords because we don't want to save them as plain text. We might want to uh, we might want to validate our user input. So they have Express Validator, which I already talked about when we talked about Express, which could be used to validate and sanitize user input. And I gave examples of that. If I did want to use Node modules, uh, Node and uh, the JWT, there is Express JWT. So uh, just like we had Express Sessions, we can also use token-based model very easily. And uh, 
if you want full authentication systems. Uh, so if you did not want to necessarily have to manage the authentication side, there are full-sized modules, AuthO, which is essentially an API for client-side JavaScript uh, toolkit. And there's also Passport, which I think we will probably look at with the lab, which is a authentication middleware for Node and Express, which is extraordinarily flexible. It's modular. It allows us to define our own uh, password and uh, username schemes, or it allows us to actually offload authentication uh, from other domains that uh, specialize in authentication. Like, so for instance, you might be able to use Passport for someone to use their Google account or their GitHub account or their Facebook account to be able to authenticate into your web application. So you don't have to manage all that, uh, all that user and password information. You just have to focus on managing your session information. So there are these, these much fuller modules that provide authentication support for you uh, that are worth looking at. And so I did want to mention them in this lecture. Excellent. Anyway, that is everything I had to do and say about authentication. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? The next lab that I'm going to assign uh, probably in the next couple of days, but not make due until like uh, the end of next week will be one that uh, resolve, revolves around authentication. So that uh, you'll be able to use that kind of as a basis for your own full stack applications if you intend for users to be able to have your own kind of personal uh, uh, profile or if you need your server to be able to identify and re-identify uh, the same client between requests. Anyway, that's it. Uh, any questions about this or did this for the most part make sense conceptually? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, I'll pro I'll provide these slides and these lectures as soon as they become available, and I'll send out an email as soon as I post that new lab for everybody. Other than that, have a great day and uh, and stay safe in all these storms. <laughs>